Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ali and I work here at What Life with Eddie, who's going to be the expert for today's webinar. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying thanks for joining us today for this first edition of the What Bike webinar series. Um, we're really excited about the turnout uh, and I think whether you're an individual who's interested in fitness or you're a gym manager, PT, SNC coach, um, I really think there's something that everyone can take away from this webinar today. Um, whether it's to improve your own health or even the health of your own clients and members. Um, so the webinar series will consist of three parts um, and they will all be run by our expert and bot bike lead sports scientist Eddie Fletcher, who has decades of experience as sports scientist and coach. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Eddie, who is going to be presenting today's topic over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. And then we will also open up the floor to any questions for the last 20 minutes. Um, again, if you have any issues or questions during the presentation, please just send them through the chat and I will try and address them as soon as possible. Um, so please enjoy and I'm going to hand over to Eddie. Right, good evening or good morning, wherever you are in the world. I know some of you have got up very early uh, for this webinar and I thank you for that. Um, so as Ali said, this is um, uh, three, uh, we're going to do three webinars. Uh, this, this first one is really setting the scene um, and putting together things we already know about the connection between uh, lack of exercise and, and, and physical health. Uh, just before I do that, I'll introduce myself to people who don't know me. So I'm Eddie Fletcher, I'm the lead, lead sport scientist uh, for Wattbike. And I've been with uh, uh, Wattbike since, uh, since the start. In fact, even before we launched the, the first product in 2008. Um, so it's been a long, a long journey. I'm also an independent sports science, scientist and I work with many athletes around the world and many teams in different sports uh, around the world. And some of you probably, probably know me. Okay, Ali, can I have the next slide? So I'm gonna talk um, about this the connection between lack of exercise and physical health and, and this is nothing new it's something we've known for decades in fact um, but it's been brought to the fore more uh, in in recent weeks uh, because of the covid19 pandemic so ali can i get to the first slide so let's start with where we are at the moment um, we know that um, being unfit and unhealthy uh, increases the risk of all sorts of uh, different things happening um, You've got um, obesity, uh, you've got um, uh, type 2 diabetes, all these sort of things which are not getting any better, they're actually getting uh, worse. Uh, but we know with COVID-19 um, that uh, it's increased the risk of uh, somebody dying uh, from this disease uh, more than probably some of the other viruses that are around. And it's um, interesting to look at some of the um, statistics which are coming out um, as, as we, we learn more and more. And when you're looking at the, 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 the numbers, um, go to trusted sources. I, uh, in the UK, uh, I use the Government Office of National Statistics. And although they are um, behind on the numbers, it's because they work off uh, the death certificates as they come in. But we know, yeah, we know age is an issue here, but we also know that 91% um, of uh, the deaths have underlying conditions and most of the underlying conditions we can do something about and they build up um, earlier in, in, in life. We're also beginning to see that um, the death rate is higher in males than females um, and for males it starts slightly earlier, curve starts at about 45 upwards and for females at about 50 upwards. But the numbers are small you're probably seeing in, in your own countries where you're listening, that it is a lot of the older people um, who are suffering from COVID-19. Um, but a lot of the underlying conditions we can do something about. And I will be showing you bits of, of research about how you can extend your life uh, by being fit and healthy and how um, you, can, you can do that very early on in life and prevent some of these things um, happening. Alec, do you have the next slide? So this inactivity, um, we've known about it for a long, long time. And we know inactivity is not getting any better. Um, I looked at some, some stats this morning from, again, in the UK, the National Health Service um, and Public Health um, England. And 
Um, activity levels are actually going down despite we think people are getting more active, they're actually not. And um, the minimum um, amount of exercise, you've got about 67% of the UK population that's active. More worrying um, is that for children, it's only at 47%. So we're probably storing up um, a bit of a problem uh, going forward. Um, so activity levels, um, uh, oh, oh, it, I mean, it says on this slide, the fourth leading risk factor for death in the world. I'm going to uh, show you on the next slide why I think it's probably nearly number one, because you can mitigate quite a lot of the other causes of death by being uh, fit and healthy. Um, and you can see that um, number from the World Health Organization, uh, where you can shorten your lifespan by three to five years. Now, I don't know about anybody else listening, but if I can get an extra three to five years of active life, then um, that's really worth um, having. Um, Ali, next slide. I think the first one it goes without saying, I mean, smoking is so deadly. Um, uh, as, a, as a sports scientist, physiology, um, uh, physiologist, I won't um, uh, put into place any exercise or training program for anybody who smokes. We have to wean them off the smoking uh, first. And again, with lack of exercise, you do have to um, start very slowly with them, even starting with walking before you do anything else. But it's responsible, this low physical activity is responsible for quite a lot of stuff. Um, you can see on there, one in 10 cases of heart disease, and just, in, just under one in five cases of colon cancer in the UK alone. And mostly part that worldwide, and it's quite a, uh, a horrifying uh, figure. Um, you can see uh, from that University of Cambridge study, and by the way, any studies or papers we refer to, um, we will be sending um, um, in, in a, a follow-up email, by the way. So we've got lack of exercise being responsible for twice as many deaths as obesity. That's a strange one in a sense because I think the two are linked and I'm going to come back to that one in particular. And this lack of activity increases the risk of, of most of the major adverse conditions that we suffer as humans. So, you know, overall early death, um, heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, um, obesity, uh, blood cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, all of these sort of things. And exercise can help tremendously here. And I link that as well with um, diet, nutrition, very important, um, sleep, work-life balance, uh, getting the stresses of life um, uh, right. And that's not easy uh, for any of us. Uh, next slide, Ali. So we've used the word shocking state uh, for decades, and it, and it, it is a shocking state. Um, we need to look here at um, some of the um, obesity um, figures. And these are, if you like, hot off the press. These are the UK and, and, and the USA. Um, I don't think these figures will shock you, uh, but they are shocking. So in the UK, 67% um, of men are overweight or obese. Women, it's 60% of women. But when you look at the obese category, uh, not just merely overweight, it's 26% of men and 29% of women in the UK. Now that obese level for my colleagues in the USA who are listening, in the USA, that's a huge, a huge figure, it's 42% of Americans um, are uh, obese. An, an interesting fact from uh, the UK hospital admissions in 2019, 876,000 admissions to hospital, they stated that obesity was a factor in that admission. The other statistic from the UK, and it, 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 you've got to take, be careful how you interpret this, is that 20% of 11 year olds are obese. And there's always a debate about uh, obesity in children um, using straightforward BMI because they do tend to grow out a, a lot of it, but it's still a statistic which is worth, worth looking at. Because we know that excess body fat disrupts the immune system. Um, and it's one of the reasons why uh, if somebody's uh, really obese that you don't put them straight into um, uh, an arduous exercise program. You might have to start off by just walking um, and getting their nutrition right to reduce the, um, the, the body fat. 
So there's lots of things we, could, we, we, we can put in there as to why. Um, technology is one, poor eating habits, um, all this consumerism. Um, so it's, 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 it's a big issue that we need to, we need to tackle. Ali, next slide. All right, so a few, I'll let you read that slide. There's a few things on there which um, may or may not shock. Uh, but the first one um, is particularly uh, pertinent to uh, all sorts of um, viruses. That one's specifically about influenza A virus. Um, so being, being a healthy weight and fitter, um, you're not going to shed the disease uh, as much. And you can see that um, this was um, the 2,204 patients admitted to the NHS ICUs, the intensive care units with COVID-19. 73% uh, were overweight or obese. Um, and then obviously I put in brackets there, not forgetting the older age group vulnerability, because as we get older, we are more vulnerable uh, to that. So it's very important, this, this obesity getting to normal weight um, is, is, is very important. The last point on here um, is also relevant. Just because your normal weight doesn't mean you're necessarily healthy. Um, you can have um, other things going on. So it's quite important that you don't just assume if somebody's normal weight that, they, that they're not gonna suffer from high blood pressure or type two diabetes. It's, it's really important to look at the, the, whole, um, the whole situation um, there. Okay, next slide, Ali. All right, this is interesting. This is hot off the press. This is from our own database. We've just started looking. Now we've got um, uh, our uh, cardiorespiratory fitness uh, test up and running. Um, I've um, sampled, as you can see, 4,267 files uh, from the last year uh, in, in our tests. Um, and these are where a test has gone to completion. Because well, as you'll see when we do the second webinar, um, you have to fulfill certain criteria to have a completed test in there. So you can see the spread, spread of ages. There's nothing unusual in there. It's what we expect from the profile of our uh, customers on there. What is interesting is the overall, what we call the CRF score, Cardiospiratory Fitness Score. It's 42, and we'll explain a little bit more about that in the second seminar. But that is low. It's a low figure. Um, it means, uh, on average, uh, they're all in the 40, 40th percentile of the population. Um, on the uh, right of the screen there, you've got the percentiles. Um, again, nothing unusual in, in there. We expect to see quite a lot of people at the bottom end, because some of this, this is a, um, a, a per kilogram type score. So um, if you're overweight, uh, the relative score will be below. The easiest way to increase your score is to shed the weight. Um, and then if you really increase it is to, uh, to, to get a lot fitter uh, on there. I'm just in the process of looking at those um, percentiles by age, but I've had a quick look through them. And to be honest, it's well spread out. Um, there's no one uh, age group uh, that predominates. So those 10% scores, those 1,371 uh, clients, are spread out across the age range. Uh, and the same for all the, 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 the other ones as well. So some real data coming through that tells us even amongst our own customers that there's a lot we can do. Um, and you will see later on in this presentation, there's a slide of how much you can improve that score by. Um, it's not difficult to improve the score uh, by a combination of uh, correct body mass um, and, 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 and doing a, a very structured uh, training plan. Um, I'm sure we'll probably publish some of this data uh, once we've analysed it all. Um, we know as well that um, from our customer base that over 7,000 people have accessed our plans now. Um, and we're just doing some work on there to talk to some of those customers about their experience or what their score was when they started, how they found their plans and what their, they, their, their score was on retest. So we're looking for that as well. So there's plenty of ways of tracking this information um, on, on the what bike app. Okay, Ali, next, uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the ex exercise in the immune system. Next slide. 
So you can see, we can immediately um, start to lower our risk um, of, of illness or major illnesses um, by lowering your risk of early death. Um, and those figures are quite huge. And in some cases, you can get even better results um, than that. It's also this thing about, we've, we've heard a lot during lockdown in the UK um, about self-esteem, mood, sleep, quality, depression, and all this type of stuff. Um, exercise helps. It does help quite a lot. Um, even if it's just getting out for a walk every day, which I've been doing in the, during lockdown every single day, out for an hour, an hour and a half um, uh, uh, walking. Um, so uh, exercise can help uh, on all sorts of things in terms of reducing the risk of suffering from some of these, um, the, the, these issues, not just the major, major illnesses, but that, that self-esteem, that, that, the, the depression and, and that type of thing. Next slide, Ali. Uh, I'm a big fan of Professor Sanjay Sharma. If you don't know of him, um, uh, Google him um, and you'll find quite a lot of uh, stuff from, from Professor uh, Sharma. We can see that just a minimum amount of exercise, and we talk about a minimum here. So when we're talking about um, active um, in the UK terms, that's 67% who are active. This is what we're talking about. So we're doing moderate exercise for 20, 30 minutes, three to four times a week. So it's not a lot. And that, that strengthens the immune system and reduces the risk of viral infection. And if you're coupling that with, with some gradually increasing um, uh, exercise, uh, and your nutrition, you're losing the body mass, you're even, uh, you're strengthening the immune system uh, even uh, more. Um, I wanted to put a question in here. We've, we've had a couple of questions, and uh, I don't know if Stephen's online, but Stephen sends us a question in advance. And he said, um, during longer sessions, when energy system, the energy system, system is depleted, is the immune system at risk? Am I more prone uh, to catching the disease at that time? If so, how can I either prevent or uh, overcome the risk? Well, the answer is no. Oh, Stephen, hi. Stephen Pottison. Um, no, there is no risk, Stephen. Um, this is distinct from overtraining. Um, there used to be a belief from um, some older research, if you like, that uh, exercise and training suppress the immune system. Um, and if anybody's interested, um, I'll make sure Ali gets a copy of it. There's a paper in 2018 from... Uh, University of Bath, um, which puts that one to, uh, to, to rest. Um, and it was because in experiments that it was seen that when somebody trained, um, the immune cells were suppressed. But in fact, what is believed happens is your immune system is so strong, those immune cells have gone elsewhere to support the rest of the body. So if you're following a very structured, consistent and progressive plan, and, and, and my uh, athletes who are probably listening have heard me say that phrase quite a lot, then you should have no problems on this. So you're getting the right dose response, and I'll talk about dose response on, on exercise and training in the next um, webinar. But if you get that balance of exercise and training right, coupled with that nutrition, then things will be okay for you. Overtraining is a different syndrome altogether. Um, and we'll, we'll, I mean, we may do a, a, another webinar where we talk about that. But if you get it all right um, and get your recovery, in particular recovery, then, Stephen, that shouldn't be a problem on that. Okay, next slide, please. Now, ah, you can see, I'll let you read that. Um, Oh, that's okay. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, yeah, so the, um, the, the immune system is quite a powerful um, instrument. Um, and if you keep it in uh, good working order, it's, it's, it's primed. It's looking for a fight. It's looking to defend your body. Um, so uh, don't worry about that in terms of, uh, of your exercise and training, provided you balance everything out. Uh, this will make your immune system much stronger. Uh, and not, not totally protect you, obviously, you were always prone to getting uh, viruses and, and, and illnesses, um, but at least it will give you a, a, better, a much better chance of, uh, of, getting, of getting things sorted out. Okay, next slide, Ali. 
All right, so this is hot off the press, and I thought it was opportune to put it in at this, this, this stage. Um, this came to me from um, uh, my UK uh, governing body, the British Association of Sport and Exercise uh, Scientists. And it's from uh, the UK Institute of Sport. And it's designed um, for coaches to look at athletes who have had a moderate um, uh, symptoms of COVID-19 and how they should get them back uh, to full training. But it's also um, a blueprint for anybody who's had any sort of viral uh, infection um, of moderate, a moderate level. If you've, been, if you've been really hit hard by a virus, then uh, the process of getting back to normal takes a much longer, you have to be much more careful. But you can see uh, the first bit is, is 10 days rest from, from, the, uh, from the onset. Uh, and then at least seven days rest um, uh, plus seven days rest. So you've got you know, 17 days there before you do anything. And again, my athletes and listeners have probably heard me say this. They, they have a, a mild illness and they want to get training straight away. And I said, no, we're going to take two or three weeks uh, to get you back um, uh, to normal. So next slide, Ali. Bit of a complex slide, but what I wanted you to see is the stages there and how it adds up in terms of the number of days. So you've got um, the earliest day to go back to full training is day 17. So you're nearly three days in. So that's how long uh, it takes to get yourself going again after you've had even mild symptoms of COVID-19 in this case, but um, I would say the same for any uh, other virus infection particularly like flu um, uh, and the like. So there's a, a 10 day minimum rest period before you start doing anything. And you're just doing normal day to day activities. And then you can see it builds up. It's fairly you know, light to moderate, um, keeping your heart rate reasonably low and not a lot of duration, as you can see um, on, on the amount of, of exercise you do. A very important part of protecting the body um, from, from these virus in, in infections and making sure that you have fully recovered and that you can return back to um, normal uh, at the earliest possible uh, moment. Don't underestimate uh, the way the body needs to recover. Give it time to recover uh, after any bout uh, of, of, of illness. Now, if you had a severe um, COVID-19 infection or you had um, what I call um, flu full-blown flu, because most people who said they've got flu recovery in two or three days haven't really got flu. Um, they've, got, they've got some viral infection, but if you had flu, you would know about it. You'd be down for two to three weeks. And we've seen on COVID-19, they can be down for more, you know, for weeks, months, um, before they start to uh, return to normal. So this is for mild to moderate um, uh, in, in infection. Uh, just so just bear that in mind and when you're talking to um, your clients uh, your personal clients or your athlete clients um, you have to be, you have to play a little bit of hardball with, with, with them um, as I do um, and say sorry no you can't go back to training yet this is what we're going to do we're going to rest and then we're going to do some light activity and we're going to gradually increase it until we get you back to full full training okay next slide Ali All right, um, let's start leading into um, the cardiorespiratory fitness uh, tests and training plans that we'll be talking about in the next seminar. But why should you test uh, fitness? Um, because if you don't test the fitness, um, you don't know where to start, it's as simple as that. Um, so you need some starting points, you need some basic information, um, you need to progress the training, and the cardio respiratory fitness test, by the way, is a submax test. Um, I'm going to, we have a question from uh, Paul in the fire service, which we'll address at the end, uh, which, which, which hinges on this. Um, I rarely maximum, maximum test, and they have to be extremely fit athletes for our maximum test. You can get all the information you need to assess somebody's initial fitness from a submaximal cardio respiratory fitness test. So we get, um, we, do, we do a test, um, we can progress test during a training plan. The beauty of doing a submax test uh, is that you can do it regularly because it doesn't hurt the body. 
um, it can just be part of a, a, a normal training session. It gives you some ongoing assessment and you can change as the fitness improves. So you're doing an initial test, you're setting the initial parameters, you'll see when we do that section. And then you're um, assessing it as it goes along and making changes as the fitness improves. And then if you're doing one of our plans in particular, at the end of the, term, of the plan, you do, a, you, you do a test again. And then you can, you can reset uh, your parameters within our app um, and you can go on to the, the next plan. Um, and in fact, if we can get it sorted, I've got a particular, isn't a no client of mine, but a, a particular uh, client who I know has done this process and he's moved from the, uh, our beginner two plan through the intermediate plan is just start to just about to start the advanced plan. So some case studies will come out um, along that, that, that basis. Um, and of course the health test can be used just as a risk assessment or, or as a, a representative uh, measure. Uh, we have an arrangement with, with Buper in the UK, one of the private medical insurance groups, um, where part of their process is they, they use our CRF test to um, use as, as a risk assessment with their clients and to talk through preventative uh, measures, um, uh, what they can do next. So you need some start points. And when we look at the cardiorespiratory fitness test, uh, you'll see how we generate um, the, the start points and allocate the training plan based on uh, what the test is telling us. Okay, Ali, next slide. All right, so we, 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 we've had a sort of little um, uh, look at um, that link between um, physical health and, and, and exercise. But it is important to, uh, to measure it, uh, to quantify it, to track it, um, and, and so you know where, where you're improving or, or where you're not improving. To get that better protection and ultimately live that, 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 that longer, longer life. Um, the question is how you do it. Question from Stuart. Did you catch that one, Ali, that question from Stuart? We'll come back to that, Stuart. Um, so we, 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 so we, we want to look at cardiovascular fitness testing. So next slide, Ali. There's a couple of papers which I would ask you to, 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 to read. Um, they're on our blog. We've done all the references in, in the blog. There's a couple of papers I particularly like. And the first one um, is from the American Heart Association. Fairly recent, 2016. It's a meta-study, so it includes, it's a, a look at all the studies, and I'm gonna put the chart up shortly, uh, looking at um, how important cardiorespiratory fitness um, is, and recommending that in the clinical practice, they should be testing for this um, as part of the, the, the routine medical examinations, which is what Bupa are doing um, in, the, in the UK. I see a question from Terry. Terry, I'll, I'll, oh yes, I'll answer that one Terry shortly for you. Um, and the second study is um, a single study, it's the American College of Cardiology Foundation, very recent, 2018. But it's a lovely study, and I, I like um, studies which are uh, longitudinal and have quite a lot of um, uh, subjects um, in them. And this is a 46 year study. Uh, so I'm going to show you some of the results of that um, on, on the, the, next, uh, the next slide. Um, so as you can see that last point, uh, CRF as I'll start calling it, um, is related to longevity. Um, and they were looking at, uh, this is four decades they were looking at, so I'm just looking at the message coming in, yes. Um, so we're gonna have a, look, a quick look at the, the, some of the stuff in those two, two studies. So you can see where we were coming from in putting together a CRF test and training plans uh, linked to it. Okay, next slide, uh, Ali. So this is not, um, not quite science-y. Uh, uh, it's, it's a shorthand way of, of saying what CRF uh, actually is. Um, so CRF um, is about uh, what you would commonly know, know as your VO2 max, your body's ability to transport oxygen to the places it's needed the most. Um, so it's really looking at the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, 
skeletal muscle systems, and um, exercise and training will develop those very aspects of, 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 of how it all looks. So CRF is health related, and if you look at those two research papers, you'll see how related it is to CRF to preventing um, serious illnesses and to prolonging uh, active life. And I'll come. I'll explain a little bit more about that last bit um, in a, in in the next webinar. But in general, a low CRF is associated with high risk of premature death, and the high CRF is associated with low risk of premature death. But I have to caveat that by saying this is um, age, then gender, and body mass related. So everything is relative to um, peer groups, and you'll see how we do that when you see how the test operates. Okay, next slide, Ellie. So this is that study I, I referred to. This is the American Heart Association study. And you can see um, quite a lot of studies in there. Uh, dating back to um, uh, the first paper, probably I, I pulled out, um, Blair et al. in, in 1995. Um, and you'll see most of their studies have got quite a lot of um, subjects in them. Uh, but the consistent message coming out of it is um, the survival, what they, they've called the survival benefit. And I, I recommend you read the paper to have a, a good look at that. Um, survival benefit per met. Now, for those that are non-scientists, um, one met um, is equal to 3.5 milliliters per kilogram um, per minute of oxygen. So it's part of that VO2 max. So if you have a VO2 max of uh, 35, um, that's 10 mets. So 35 divided by 3.5. Um, on any measure, um, that, that the mean survival benefit per met increase in fitness uh, is 17%. Uh, what does that mean? Um, well, it means you've got a far better chance of uh, not getting some of these non-communicable diseases uh, and living a longer uh, active life. Next slide, Ali. All right, this is the second paper. This is the American uh, Cardiology uh, Foundation. And I like this slide. It's, it's the headline um, numbers you can use uh, with clients. So we're talking about somebody's VO2 max here. So a one point increase in VO2 max gives you 45 days extended life. Doesn't sound a lot, but I'd take 45 days for one point. Um, so if you went from that 35 to 36, you've got yourselves another 45 days. And that is quite easy to achieve. You can achieve that by losing some body mass if you've got excess body mass. An eight point increase is one year extended life. So if you went from 35 to um, 43, that's uh, extended your life by one. The big point about VO2 max, it's genetic at the start, but it's extremely and highly trainable. So it's possible to increase that figure by 20 to 30 points. So you're talking about an awful lot more uh, years of, uh, of active life um, and I've had clients who improved it by even more than that because if you're obese and you lose the body mass and you get yourself fit you're going to get huge gains in that VO2 max and therefore your CRF score and I've seen CRF scores for, go from that 10% level up to the 90% level um, so that's a huge huge gain on the, on the uh, next slide, Ali. Oh, no, just go back a slide. Just go back a slide, Ali. Yeah. All right. I, I ought to put on that slide. Um, if you look at that study, um, the mean um, increase in uh, active life was three to five years over that forty-six years, and that's a huge, huge gain. Um, I'll, I'll take that uh, at my, my age, I'll take that uh, if I can get it. Okay, Ali, next slide. All right, I want to cover this, this point about uh, direct and indirect measurement. Um, direct measurement um, is, is talked about as being the, the, gold, the gold standard, um, but it does, it's not without its, its, its vagaries, if you like. Um, but 
the thing about an indirect measurement is that um, it's a consistent measure. And you can see there, there are numerous studies, and you go back to that American Heart Association paper, um, that both measured and estimated CRF strongly predict health outcomes. So ours is um, um, uh, an indirect method. Um, it's an estimated CRF from um, well-known uh, scientific um, algorithms in there. And the other thing you have to look at is um, submaximal testing. There's a tendency for people to max test people, um, and it's something I do very rarely. You have to be really careful about maximal tests. So we had to come up with a, a way of doing a submaximal test, and we'll describe that in the next seminar, um, that um, would get rid of the risk of doing a maximal test. Um, because um, unless you're doing it under strict medical conditions, maximum tests can be quite uh, disastrous. And even in my lab, um, I have people um, hooked up to heart rate monitors, ECGs, all sorts. So I can intervene if, if necessary. If you haven't got the equipment and you haven't done the medical screening, um, it's best to stay quite away from uh, maximum tests. So a sub-maximal test, you can see, does provide a reasonable accurate reflection um, of, of fitness, it's lower cost, and it's reduced risk, and I quite like reducing the risk. That is a quotation from the American College of Sports Medicine, um, which I quite like. Next slide, Ali. All right, let's just talk a little bit about the uh, what by health assessment, just to set the scene for the uh, second seminar. Next slide. So it's a submax test. It's non-invasive, and it's appropriate to all levels. The results that come out of it are age, gender, and body mass dependent. So you get an individual CRF score uh, for each, each client. So it's important that when you do this test, because the test is in the app, um, that the profile is set up correctly. So the date of birth needs to be accurate, uh, male and female, um, and the body mass needs to be, be in there. There's one other criteria which we'll talk about in the next uh, webinar. You have to set something called a, a fitness level to make sure the test starts at the right level. So not everybody starts at the, at the same level. Depends on your fitness level as to where you start the test. The test also um, links to our training plans. So once you've done the test and you get your CRF score, that will be telling you which of our plans you need to be doing. Um, so you can get the um, the, the, the development you need, you're not going to get, you're going to get the right dose response for, for the plan itself. And the plans um, start at the very basic level. Some people need to start just spinning their legs out. Um, so we've got a beginner's one, beginner's two, uh, we've got an intermediate and an advanced. And then for people who've reached a particular standard and they want to maintain their fitness, we have um, a maintenance uh, plan as well. All right, next slide. So I ought to really cover, I suppose, and I am, I, I am biased, obviously, but why would you do it on a walk-by? Um, well, it's that accurate control of the, of the test. Um, we, we, we developed, it took us years to develop the, uh, the walk-by. Um, it's real-time force measurement, um, so it's a very scientific uh, tool. So you get that accuracy, you get that repeatability and comparability um, from test to test and from training session to training session. We do have that unique pedal technique. Um, one of the real keys to getting that fitness level up very quickly is to master the pedal technique. And again, some of my uh, athletes who are listening will recognize me telling them that. You can get immediate gains in your fitness with the correct technique, because the correct technique means you're using the right muscles in the right proportions on there. You can also, um, because the app will guide you through this, once you've got your test result, the, the sessions will be automatically set in the correct resistance for you. You know what gear you're going to be in. You know what RPM you're going to be using in relation to your power zones and your heart rate zones. And you've done that all from a non-invasive and non-intimidating submax test. You can obviously, because you've got everything in the app, you can measure progress, um, you can retest, you can reset the exercise um, and training zones as fitness improves. And I've had clients where we've not completed the plan, we've moved them uh, very quickly onto the next plan. Particularly if you're at the beginner's level, beginner's one and beginner's two, 
it's quite easy to progress within, because these plans are at 12 weeks, it's quite easy to progress within four weeks, eight weeks, and, and need to reassess and, and, and move it on. And of course, within our hub, all of your workouts are recorded all the time. They're always there, they're always in the history, um, and they're there forevermore, so you can have a look at them um, in, in there. So there we are. So we've got five 12 week exercise and training plans um, from beginning to our advanced level based on the initial CRF score. And in the next webinar, I'll talk about how I designed those plans with the dose, what we call the dose response and mortality risks involved to make sure that people train the correct number of, of, of hours and minutes. Um, because the mortality risk comes shooting down as you train. But if you start to overtrain, the mortality risk will go up. So there, very balanced training plans. All right, next slide. All right, so it, uh, before we have questions, it reminds me just to uh, flag up the next uh, webinar, which is uh, same time, same place, on the 2nd of July. And we'll be looking uh, at detail at the CRF test and uh, the, what we call the Walkback Health Assessment. So we'll be looking at, um, in a bit more detail, what is CRF, uh, how, I'm going to, how we're measuring it, why is it more important than some of the other things we talk about. I'll go through what the health assessment test is, what the outcomes are, um, and then how it links to, um, uh, to the assessment plans and, and, and the retest process. Okay, Ali, thank you for listening. We are open for questions. We do have one question from Paul in the fire service. Um, Yes. Um, thank do you have that question, Ali? Yes, I do. Um, so we did have, um, like you said, we did have some people sent in questions, and this was specifically from Paul, who's a fitness advisor and tester in the fire service. Hi, Paul. Hope you joined us today. Um, so you mentioned this briefly before when it comes to max capacity testing. So Paul said that he's worried about testing protocols for people who are being tested to their max capacity to fulfill specific employment requirements. So in this case, to be a part of the fire services, um, the age range of firemen and women being tested is, is between 20 to 60 years old, and they have the same pass score regardless of age or gender. So what safeguards can you put in place if you have to test someone that needs to go to a, a max effort to pass a fitness test? Yeah, right. I mean, what Paul, I don't know what Paul knows, but um, I designed the uh, fire service test that is in our app. Um, and I set that, um, that standard uh, to match the fire service um, standard they, they already have in place. Just to explain to, 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 to listeners, um, the fire service in the UK have um, one standard, um, which uh, is irrespective of, of, of age and gender and body mass. So it makes it very, very difficult. Um, what I've said to Ali is um, if, 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 if we can get Paul's email address, I will um, talk to him offline as well. But essentially, um, yeah, you need a full medical screening, obviously. And because of the nature of the test, uh, that test will be easier for some and it'll be a max for others. Um, and so it's quite, it, it can be um, quite difficult for quite a lot of them, particularly the older ones. Um, although what we found during testing, that the older ones, um, because of their years of training, uh, didn't fare, fare too badly uh, on the test. But I would do full, obviously full medical screening. The other thing I'll show you, Paul, is that you actually can use a sub-maximal test to assess whether they can do that test in the first place. Um, and it was something before lockdown that we were going to talk to the fire centers about. So, right, okay, yes, you have this test in place. Um, and for some it will be a maximum test, others it won't be. So is there a way that we can look at it so it's not stressful on any of the fire service personnel before you actually decide whether you're going to do, them do the test? So um, my precaution would be to do a sub-maximal test first um, and probably do the CRF test because it's, it, 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 it's fine. Um, it'll also give them a score which you know um, will tell you whether they've got the the VO2 max figure that the fire service want, um, and you can also estimate from that sub max score whether they can actually do the test in the first place. Can they max the power per kilo that, um, that is required? Uh, it's for people who are listening, they have to achieve uh, 2.66 uh, watts per kilo uh, for 10 minutes. 
Oh, it's Paul Wainwright. Hello, Paul. Yes, yes. Um, yes, so, I yes. Think, sorry to interrupt you, but yes, yeah. no, I think that covers it quite nicely. I th yes, I was, Paul, yeah. I'll put you in touch with Eddie so you can speak more specifically about the fire testing. Um, so I think it was easier if I connect to you guys over email. So I'll, I'll do that um, after the webinar is over so you can, guys can chat about that. Um, we've had some other questions come through, Eddie. So one is from Richard who is asking if um, VO2 max is factored for age. Yes, it is. Um, our our um, CRF score is factored for age, gender, um, and, and body mass. Um, and we, we use a couple of algorithms. Um, um, Stora itself from 1990, because uh, it's one of the few that has um, age, um, gender, and body mass included in the algorithm. And we also then compare that against an ACSM uh, uh, chart uh, of percentiles uh, by, by age, age and gender. Okay, thanks Eddie. Um, we did have a question from Terry as well who wants to know how often these tests can, must be done. Um, Hi Terry. Terry, Terry B was that? Yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Hi Terry. Um, the so, a submax test is a great test because you, 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 can, you can do them quite regularly. Um, I, I, I don't do them that regular. I would do one at the start, obviously. You need the start point. So you do a, the, the, the submax test, the, the health assessment. And then if you're monitoring the client, um, if you're seeing rapid improvement, and it, the rapid improvement could be um, uh, their heart rate reducing uh, for the same sessions and so on, then um, you could do a retest. Um, I wouldn't do a retest probably for the first four, maybe even eight weeks. I do tend to leave it the full 12 weeks, even though you're probably fine if they are on that, 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 that uh, steep curve, improvement curve. You know, it, the sessions might get easier and easier for them, but you, you're, you're embedding other things um, in, in, into the, with the, the pedal revolutions and the pedal technique and one or two other things. So I do tend, Terry, to um, not do them um, in the first 12 weeks. So every 12 weeks, essentially. Um, but I have been able to do them slightly early if, the, if you've got a massive, really rapidly, rapidly improving um, uh, client on your hands. Okay, thanks Eddie. Um, I have another question from Stuart who wants to know how much emphasis should be given to heart rate zones. He's particularly interested in recovery phases of a training session. Yes, yes. Um, as people who know me, I put great store by heart rate. Um, up to a point. Um, I separate it into two, 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 two things. Again, my athletes listening will be, be familiar with, with, with this. Um, when I'm uh, sort of uh, getting that oxygenation around the body, let's, 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 let's really get that aerobic fitness um, in there. Um, uh, the first control um, is, is, is heart rate. Um, and depending on what sport it is, um, so on the bikes, we'll talk about what bike, the first control is, 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 is RPM for the session itself and then heart rate, and then power. So if they find their heart rate is bust, it's gonna above where it should be, and the app will tell you it's, there's a green zone when, you're, when, when it's where it should be, there's an amber zone where it's beginning to go out of the zone, and then there's a red zone, and I don't take too much action until it goes into the red zone, because you've got to have some allowances around that. But once that happens, keep the RPMs going, and take the resistance down to bring the heart rate back into check. Now, over time, you'll find it'll start to balance out. So, training zones are aspirational, so you have to train the body. The danger is if you ignore heart rate, because the heart rate, when people think heart rate is variable, it is, but it's the great barometer of the, of the body. It tells what the body's doing at any particular point in, in time. So, heart rate is fantastic for keeping you in the, the area you should be. So, if you should be, I don't know, using your heart rate up to 130, you find it's 150. You're doing a completely different session. Um, and it could be an indication of something else. You could have an illness coming on. Um, there could be, um, you could have a heart issue, for instance, or whatever it might be. So quite important. But then when it comes to the higher intensity sessions, and you'll see them in the plans, then the heart rate goes further down the list. So there we're trying to keep the RPM and the power element. Um, and, then, and then keeping an eye on, 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 on the heart rate. So, um, is it, was it Stuart, Ali? Uh, yes. I yes, yeah. so Stuart, the answer, the answer is it, it, it's part of 
the parameters you would look at. So on the parameters on a watt by is the beauty of the watt by. You're looking at power, heart rate, and cadence. You're also looking at pedal technique as well. Um, and you're also getting the gearing right. So there are those five parameters you can, you can use, and we um, uh, structure them into the training plans in the right proportions. Okay, I actually have another question about heart rate, which ties into this quite nicely. So this is from Alison. Um, she's used the Watt bike for the past five years at work. She's an active road cyclist and she's done the 10 minute health assessment. Um, and it stated that her heart rate was too high for the test, even though she kept cadence and wattage in the green throughout. Uh, she said she wasn't struggling. She has a resting heart rate of 60, but when she trains, her heart rate is always high. Um, she okay. says she really wants to calculate the training zones for future use and what test would you recommend? Right, okay. Um, what we don't ask is, 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 I'm assuming you did the initial test and then you've done the 10 minute test, which you should do after the 12 week training plan. But I don't know, is, did, did you do this? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I think it sounds like Alison just did the 10 minute health assessment. Alison, ah, right. um, ah, right. okay. uh, all right. Yes, you can't just jump on the bike and do the 10 minute health assessment. It's predicated on um, doing a uh, CRF test, sub max test, then doing a 12 week training program, and then doing that 10 minute test. Because that 10 minutes test, and everybody should be able to pass that if they've done 12 weeks training, the 10 minute test, and we'll be covering it in the next webinar. Um, it's based on your initial test. So it should, you should always be able to do, be able to do it. It is sub sub max as well. It's done at 65% of, um, uh, of, of your initial test. So it's not a test that you should be doing without doing the training program. So it's sub max test first, get on your zone set, do a 12 week training program, and then do the 10, the 10 minute health assessment. And then all should be well. Okay, thanks Eddie. Um, I have another one from Josh, who is six months post ACL reconstruction, ex-military. Mm -hmm. He wants to know if you think taking the, um, so we have a military test that is called the A3 test. So he we wants do. to know if the A3 test is a good starting point to get back into training on the Watt bike or not. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> um, again, if you mind, I designed the, uh, the Army A3 test on the, on, on the Watt bike. Um, it, it, uh, just to give a, bit, a little bit of history, a couple of minutes. Um, it used to be um, age um, uh, and, and gender based, um, and it's moved recently in the last uh, years to set standards. And the standard depends on the, the job, the function you are performing uh, within the army. But again, it's a little bit like what we've just been talking about. It's not one you would jump on the bike and just do straight away. Um, it's not an easy test to do if you haven't done the training. So with an ACL, I'd be very, you know, very careful. You've got to rehab the ACL. Um, we do have um, on our, our uh, app, we have the Uniform Services uh, training plan. It's the basic plan that prepares somebody to do the 10 minute test. So I would suggest that is the one to do. Uh, we've nearly finished, we haven't quite loaded it yet, but we then have an advanced training plan for the Uniform Services. Um, and there's a maintenance plan as well to go in. And by uniform services, we do mean uh, the army, uh, we, we mean the fire service, police service, and so on. But no, I wouldn't recommend you just jump straight into the 10 minute test. Do yourself a sub max test, do the uniforms, the uniform services training plan, then do your, um, do your army test. Okay, thanks. Um, I can notice there's a car alarm going on in the background, so if that's too loud, please let me know and I will just mute myself. Um, um, we have another question from um, Rowan. Apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly. So um, says, I'm a road cyclist. Please explain the unique pedal stroke in more detail. Again, I don't know if you want to cover that Right now, Eddie, I would probably recommend um, reading about it more on our website, but feel free to mention so. something. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, if, if, you can, if you can get the email address and, and we'll send some stuff out, but um, I have a look on, 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 on our material about um, pedal technique, but I can send some stuff out. Um, I mean, we, do, we are aware that we probably need to do a webinar just on pedal technique. And if I do them one-on-one -on -one with, with, with individuals, um, it, it would take another, um, yes, another, another hour for me to go through that if we were going to do it. Um, and, we, and we'd need slides as well, some, some slides to cover it as well. So I, I kind of suggest that, you know, we get an email exchange 
Yes, um, I would suggest anyone that has any more questions or if you're missing any material, if you can just email marketing at whatbike.com, I will make sure those questions are answered. I'll um, type that into the chat as well so you can get back to me with any questions um, you didn't get answered today or if you're looking for more information. Um, so we have another question. Um, someone says, I'm a cycling coach and they want to know which is better for testing VO2 max. The three minute and 12 minute test or the sub max test? Um, um, to, sorry, let me just see what it says. I used to use the sub max test as a warm up to max test on trained athletes and regular riders looking for a baseline. So which would you advise is best for testing VO2 max then specifically? Yeah, I would, um, exactly what you've just said. Um, don't go straight into the three minute test because um, you don't know when to set it, basically. Um, I would do the submax test. Um, the, uh, the, the, the max minute power that comes out of that, the estimate, is what you should be able to do for three minutes. The beauty of a submax test, and I do the same as you do, um, is it acts as a warm up as well. So it's a great warm up. Um, you stop it at the submax level, you get the estimate of MMP, and whilst you're doing that, they just loosely pedaling and then you can put them straight into the three minutes so you'll know exactly where to set the three minute so you can set the three minute uh, the right resistance to uh, the right out be able to produce the power you want and then do the three minute test um, that's the way i would do it mm -hmm. um, failing, failing that failing that if they are um you know extremely fit um uh, you know, cyclists then i would do a max test i do do i mean i, I did say earlier on that i do more sub max than max test but if they're um, um, a well-established cyclist, you can do a max test to get those figures. Okay, great. Um, following on again from the testing, someone wants to know, um, Jim wants to know how you work out when to end the sub-max test, please. <laughs> yes, um, great question. And we're gonna be covering that in the next webinar, I'm gonna just say that. Um, but um, there's two, two aspects to the termination point. Um, one is a, a, an RPA, RPE, uh, rate of perceived exertion, uh, level seven on a, on a one to 10 scale, or 85% of a known max heart rate. But I'll cover that in the second webinar. Okay, thanks. Um, then we've got another question from Andrew, who is in South Africa. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Um, yeah. He wants to know if the bike will help with cardiorespiratory fitness for, for trail running. Um, or must I use it for the test to see progress? Um, just, just repeat that for me, Ali. Yeah, I, I don't know, Andrew, if you want to ask that question again, because I'm not sure I'm following. Are you asking if the bike will help with your general cardiorespiratory fitness for other sports? Um, I think maybe that's what Andrew is, yeah. is asking, but feel free to correct us. Um, well, yes, um, yes, so if the yeah. cardiorespiratory fitness tests and the plans will help for other sports, for example, trail running. My answer is undoubtedly yes. Um, I look after um, multiple sport athletes and um, cycling, uh, or particularly walk biking, is, is, is part of the, the mix. Um, you'd be amazed, uh, because you're taking the pressure off the body, just how much cycling in particular can help other sports. Um, if any of my triathletes are listening, I don't know where they are, uh, they, would know, they know that um, when they first come to me, I take the running off. And I put more biking in, particularly what biking, um, and their running improves. So you can improve your running um, by doing some very specific drills uh, on the what bike. Uh, and if Andrew's interested in some of that stuff, then he can email me and uh, I'll give him some indication of, 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 of the sort of stuff he can do. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. I know, yeah, we've done a lot of work on what's called off feet conditioning, is basically yeah. what Eddie's talking about. So, we do have a lot of materials and a lot of different examples from all kinds of sport of people who are substituting on feet. So, running, for example, with off feet things like more bike works. We do have a lot yeah. of materials available on that if anyone was interested. Yeah. And, 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 and as I know, as I, I, I've worked with rugby clubs in the UK, rugby union, rugby league, where we've taken them off running. Um, as a straight running as a conditioning tool and put them on a walk bike um, and then on the pitch they are much faster than they were before um, yeah, they're reaching, reaching peak speeds a lot earlier uh, at much higher levels so it's got a, it, it, you know, our feet conditioning on the walk bike uh, is great for many many sports 
yes. It, I know with the rugby specifically, we've also noticed a lot of um, player longevity increasing by taking away a lot of on-feet stuff because it does put so much stress on the body. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of good examples and case studies about that if anyone is interested to see how you can supplement um, on-feet training with the bike for many different sports, you'd be quite surprised. Um, we have, you know, swimming and rugby all sorts of people substituting this with what bikes and it's working out really well so that's been really interesting to see um so those are all the questions that have been sent in does anyone have any other questions in the meantime please feel free to send them through now we'll just give that a minute just to see if anyone is typing oh thank you guys thank you, Thanks. Thank you Stuart. feedback um, yeah, I, I wanted to say thank you to you all for tuning in um, and I will be sending out the recording of the webinar today as well as the PowerPoint and a few other useful resources to you all tomorrow. Um, and like Eddie said before, we really hope that you join us next week when we cover um, cardiorespiratory fitness testing in more detail and also tell you about the Watt Bike Health Assessment. Um, I will be sending out more information on the second webinar next week. Um, and to find out more, you can, in the meantime, you can visit our website at wattbike.com. Um, if you want to discuss how you can use your wattbikes more effectively, or if you want more information about the new products or any other information that was covered today, uh, please just email us at marketing at wattbike.com. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, I really appreciate the good feedback. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you guys. And we hope to see you again next week.